Okay, welcome to today's lecture. And today we're going to continue with magnetic resonance, the essential parts. In particular, we're going to start with the first half of the course, asking ourselves the question on how is the EMR signal detected. Then we're going to take a brief detour in quantum mechanics to show what we talked about last week does have a correspondence in quantum mechanics. This is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And then we're going to discuss what, why one uses the rotating frame as a description. In the second part of today's lecture, we're going to cover first the return of the magnetization to the equilibrium state, to thermodynamic equilibrium. And finally, what is the behavior of the magnetic resonance magnetization in the presence of an external magnetic field. That will conclude today's lecture. And then we'll have next week on Wednesday in CE4, we will have the course on tracer kinetics just before Easter break. It'll be at 4.30. OK, so first some examples on how MRI, MR images look like. And the key message here is that this, the appearance of the images, the contrast, depends strongly on experimental parameters. And here we're going to look at the time after excitation, TE. We'll see more later in this semester what is exactly meant by TE. So here is, after the excitation, 25 milliseconds afterwards, this is a human head. This is where the nose would be. This is where, where the uh, sinuses are. Right here, this is the cerebellum, the back of the head. It's a cut like this through the head. 25 milliseconds, it looks like this. 50 milliseconds later, it is different, slightly different. This is what it looks like, 75 milliseconds. You can see quite a change in contrast, and 100 milliseconds even stronger. And the only thing that was varied here is the time after excitation. We'll talk about what excitation exactly is. We already discussed it a little bit with the V1 field. And here's another example on how the appearance of the image strongly changes with increasing TE going from this all the way to sort of a myelogram here on the bottom. That was one experimental parameter. And here's another one, and that's the flip angle. And then we have another parameter, and that is the time between excitations. And we'll see today, in today's course, what are the factors that influence um, the signal. So just as a reminder, we introduced at the end of last week's course the flip angle, the alpha, so that's basically the magnetization is tilted away from the z direction by an angle alpha. And this can be any angle between 0 and 180 degrees. Well, actually, it has, cannot be 0 and cannot be 180. And now you look here, 10 degrees up to 90 degrees. And then we have the time between excitations, or repetition time, from 17 to 1,250 milliseconds. And you can see here how the contrast changes with time between excitations, as well as the flip angle. And notice here. At 90 degrees, it's very dark, the images. There's some bright spots. Those are actually blood vessels which are not affected equally because of magnetization flowing into the slice. Again, it's sagittal orientation of the image. So here's the nose. Here's the tongue. This is the brain stem, the back of the head. Here's the visual cortex, cerebellum. And that's the cerebrum here. Give you an idea. So with these two examples, we can already see we have introduced three experimental parameters that vastly change the appearance of an image. And this is what makes MR, magnetic resonance, a much more complicated modality than the X-ray techniques that we saw, because we have far fewer parameters uh, with, the, with CT with which we can influence contrast, for example. OK, so let's do a recapitulation. What do we know about magnetic resonance so far? 
Well, what do we need for magnetic resonance? We need a nucleus with non-zero spin. A zero spin nucleus is not visible. One needs a magnetic field, we call that B0. And with that, what does one get? One gets a nuclear magnetization, and in this case, if one just pictures going into the magnet, doing nothing, what one gets is the thermodynamic equilibrium magnetization, which we always call M0. The magnitude of this magnetization is dictated by the Boltzmann distribution, that is, the unequal population of spins in the diff two different energy levels that we discussed last week. So what are the factors that influence the equilibrium magnetization? <coughs> so the magnetization increases with the number of spins in the voxel. The more spins you have, the more is the disequilibrium between the two energy levels, so you have more magnetization. It increases with magnetic field B0, so the stronger the magnet, the higher is the equilibrium magnetization, and it increases with the gyromagnetic ratio gamma, because that has as a consequence a higher separation of the energy levels, and therefore a bigger difference in the Boltzmann distribution of the spins in the energy levels. So, from this and these considerations, one can conclude that there is one particularly suitable molecule for MRI. And that is the proton in water. Okay, notice I called it proton and not hydrogen atom because we're looking, of course, just at the nuclear spin, so that's the proton in H2O. H2O because it's most sensitive, the proton because it has the highest gyromagnetic ratio. And that's what we're going to, for pretty much the entire course, assume that what we are imaging is water. We're going to have a little discourse on imaging or measuring other chemical species other than water. And that will be in the first course after Easter. OK, what have we learned also? Well, the thermodynamic equilibrium magnetization, M0, is parallel to B0. And we've defined that this direction is called Z. So magnetization is parallel to B0. We have the equation of motion. That's the Larmor equation. So now, if we start out at thermodynamic equilibrium, we have M0, which is parallel to B0. So that is, unfortunately, 0. So there is no change in the nuclear magnetization. And that is a very uninteresting case because M0, in this case, does not undergo any motion, the magnetization. So there's nothing to be detected. There's no signal. And that is basically the conclusion here. So this, all this that I've talked to you about last week does not generate a measurable signal. We have a nuclear magnetization, but no measurable signal. That was one of the difficulties in detecting the magnetic resonance phenomenon some 70 years ago, roughly, that until one found a way to make the magnetization move and detect the motion of the magnetization, it was practically impossible to prove that there is magnetization associated to the nuclei. OK, so now I'll come to the question, how is the MR signal detected? And this is actually intrinsically linked to the question on how does one generate a measurable signal. So the two processes are linked, So, but we'll start out with the question on how to detect um, the MR signal. OK, and the basic principle here is what you see here is a magnet that's physically being moved. That magnet induces a change in voltage in this coil, and that change in voltage in the coil, the current can be measured. What's behind this is Faraday's law of induction. So we have the electromotive force, which is equal to the negative of the change in magnetic flux. Here's the definition of the magnetic flux. So it's a surface integral of the magnetic field. It's a function of 
position and time times the surface vector. Okay, what is dA? It basically represents this surface here, and it's a vector that's perpendicular to the surface. Now, for magnetic resonance, the situation is simple. The area doesn't change. We're not physically changing any geometry. So the area as a vector is constant. And so the electromotive force is essentially proportional to the change in magnetic field per time. We have length law to consider. So the induced voltage in the coil here, in this case, is producing a current. The current produces a magnetic field that opposes the change in magnetic flux. That produces the current. This is actually completely analogous to power generation. And this is something for those of you who are bicycling at night um, is what you use there. That's power generation here. You turn the magnet and we'll do look at that shortly. So then we have the other thing is to, concern, uh, to consider is Biot-Savart's law. Um, it's not very accurate in all the details, but it gives you the essential elements. The magnetic field essentially falls off with distance squared. So here's the expression. We have a current. We have uh, uh, the, the dl along the direction of the current with the vector product of the distance divided by r squared. That gives us the magnetic field produced by a current. So these are the two um, major features to consider, especially the last one. So I'll try to illustrate this first theoretically, then practically. So let's start with a bar magnet. We can picture a bar magnet, right? So here's the bar magnet. Here is a coil. It's just an electrical loop, a copper loop. Now we're going to have to turn this magnet, this little bar magnet, and we're going to look at what's happening to the induced voltage. I'll just depict here the magnitude of the induced voltage that's measured across here. So if the magnet's turning, the induced voltage will do a sinusoidal variation. OK, that's the principle here. If we take the magnet further away, then we have the same observation. But you can see now the magnitude of the induced voltage is lower. That's because of Biot-Savart down here that were further away. You can picture it very simple. Somebody turns a magnet over in Paris. We don't really care what's happening here. But if he turns it, he or she turns it very close to the coil, then we can measure the induced voltage. OK, so. I'll illustrate this principle before we go on and, and make the link to nuclear magnetization. So we have again here the situation with the bar magnet. And this is the bar magnet. And I have to see that I get the right experiment here. That's the wrong one. Did you see this? Here's my bar magnet. I turn it. Nothing happens. I get closer. I start moving it. And you can see now here the induced voltage. This is the coil. This is just a simple copper loop. And if I now change the orientation of the magnet, you can see the induced voltage here. Um, to, to illustrate this in another case, this is two LEDs here. I'll put them here. And if I now move the magnet in sufficiently fast, depending on the direction, these are two LEDs, so they change positive or negative current. The blue one here is one direction. The red one is the other one. And you can see it has to do with the motion. If I hold it still, nothing happens. OK, so we can picture what's happening with, um, with a bar magnet. That's the situation um, 
here. So now let's take magnetization. How is magnetization? Um, moving the magnetization has the same properties. Here's the coil. We'll draw here the induced voltage. And now if the magnetization is moving, processing in the external magnetic field, then we have an induced voltage in the coil. So the analogy is here. The magnetization from the nuclei, when it processes about the B0, will induce a change in magnetic field that is detectable by a nearby conducting structure, such as this coil here. And if we do the same thing as with the bar magnet, we have the magnetization far away. It's like it is further away. And then we will have a weaker induced uh, voltage in the coil. So the magnetic field of the nuclear dipole decreases with distance. And therefore, the electromotive force decreases with distance um, from the magnetization. So the further away one is with this coil from the object of interest, the weaker the signal gets. So this is the detection. And as promised you, I'll make the link to the excitation. So how does this work? How does one generate an RF field B1 that we talked about last week? Well, you can imagine it's the inverse process. Here's the coil. And now we'll apply a current to the coil, I of t. And we'll look at what happens with the B1 field. So if I apply an oscillating current here, then I get a B1 field that goes around. OK, for some of you, you might notice that I'm cheating here in this animation. This configuration that we have here will not produce a circularly polarized B1 field, which is what you're seeing now. It's a B1 field that rotates. But you can always reconstitute a circularly polarized, a linear polarized B1 field as a superposition of two circular polarized B1 fields, one going one way and the other one going the other way. OK, so that's the simplification. Well, basically, it's just the inverse process. We're applying a current to the coil, and this produces a sinusoidal B1. If we go further away from the coil, well, we'll have, again, a circular polarized B1, but now with weaker magnitude. So it's the inverse process here. OK, and um, this is the same setup that I have here. So this is now the coil that produces the current. It's a copper coil. If I turn this on, you see there's something happening. So there's current flowing through here. Nothing is happening on the right side. That's basically measuring the magnetic field. And now if I move it closer, you start to see the induced uh, current. That's a measure of the of the magnetic field. Go away. Nothing happens. If we're close, we turn it on. Then we can see uh, the stronger current. Or to illustrate this more here. So we have, on this side, and you can see it on the overhead screen. So what I have here is um, the magnet on the outside. That's the blue part. And then we have the, the coil that's turning. And now we have essentially just a change in magnetic flux in the coil. And that gives us a nice current. That's the principle of power generation. You can do the reverse thing. On with this setup here, now we're ch changing the, the, the magnet. That's the green coil here that you see on the screen. And the in the coils that are these copper coils here with all the wirings, that's the voltage that's induced. That will be here now the situation of magnetization turning and detecting the, uh, the current in the coils nearby. So, this is completely analogous to what we know from electrical power generation, except that we're looking here at, at um, 
the effect of nuclear magnetization on uh, V1 production, uh, the effect of nuclear magnetization on the induced voltage. So the V1 field increases with distance from the RF coil, whether we detect it or whether we want to produce a V1 field, it increases, it uh, decreases with distance from the coil. Okay, so what does an MR detector look like? These are some examples. Since distance is very important, the key here is we have a detector, we call it coil, for every organ. Okay, to illustrate the principle, this is what one ideally would want to have. That's how a physicist would design an MR machine, squeeze the object into the coil to get the maximum signal out. The physician will say, hey, wait, 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 wait. Into that configuration, I can't get no patient and I can't no bill for my scans, so it has to be uh, a bit more patient friendly, so one has to find a compromise. And this is what a compromise looks like. It looks nice from the outside and it gives enough space for the subject. This is a coil for the human head. So here's this subject. And if you think this looks like a bird cage, you're absolutely right. Actually, this design is called a bird cage. Then we have coils for the breast, for the pelvic face, for the pelvis. This is again a head coil. What is this? Well, this is probably an endorectal coil here, and here's a prostate coil. Okay, very painful to insert. You can imagine where this is being inserted, but you want to get it close to the prostate for the measurement. And obviously, if you want to look at a mouse, you're building something that's not adapted for the humans, but one is building a coil that's adapted for uh, the mouse. So in this case, we're looking at a distance here. The mouse head is typically 15 millimeters across, so you can see how small this is the part of the RF coil that one is detecting. And now here, um, we actually have some real examples in the lecture hall, thanks to Guillaume, who is up there. So I'll show it. These are now built in the lab. What you can see is all this copper color, lots of copper in here. What you can see here is loops. Those are the loops for the detection of the signal. Here, two loops, and there's a third loop. This is for a very particular experiment for not only detecting protons, but also carbon-13. Um, that's what the patient never sees, because they don't like to see copper, so you would color code it. And here's another, uh, another coil that's very similar to the birdcage type design that you've seen on screen. It's a, it's a different way of exciting the RF field, um, specifically adapted for higher magnetic field strength, like 7 Tesla. But the key features that you see, the rungs, for the birdcage coil, we have eight plates here. They create a circularly polarized B1 field. And a specialty here is that each one of them is specifically um, driven by the current that's put in here. But these are the key elements. They have to be adapted to the right frequency. And for the human, you would put the head in here. Um, I think that will look funny enough if I try it. So, you know. There you go. All right. You, of course, lie down, but that's sort of the idea um, for the scans. And you can see you don't want to pick a big, build a big coil. You won't see a signal. And you don't want to build it such that I scratch my nose. So it has to be somewhere close to the comfort zone of the patient or the subject. OK, so these are the RF coils. And with that, we're not going to talk too much about detection and excitation. The main principle, the main take-home message here is every organ has its own coil, wrist, what did we see, breast, pelvis, heart, wrist, finger, knee, um, we had prostate, mouse, rat, dog, whatever, 
a specific um, in, um, organ of, in, or, uh, uh, of interest uh, wants. OK, so now we'll come back to the rotating frame. We now know how we can make a magnetization go into the transverse plane. We know that we can detect its precession. And I want to come back to the question, why did we bother to go into the rotating frame last week? It's a fairly complex, uh, complicated approach to look at. So um, we'll start out with the magnetization M that is valid in any reference frame in the presence of a B0. And we've introduced last week that this is given by the rate of change of the magnetization is given by a delta uh, B times gamma cross the magnetization. This equation we've seen last week is very simple to interpret. It basically just means that the magnetization precesses in the xy plane with the frequency gamma delta B effective. This is what I call here delta B effective. And you'll see shortly why it's not called just delta B over 2 pi. OK, so now a rotating frame. We've said that's a reference frame that rotates about Z. We're only considering rotating frames about Z. So they rotate about Z at a frequency omega RF. And now I'll consider two cases. The case one is the non-rotating reference frame, so omega RF is zero. So in that case, the magnetization precesses in the xy plane with the frequency gamma B0 over 2 pi. That's the lab view, the lab reference frame. So here's that's our reference frame, x and y could be this, and z is my vertical axis. That's what you can picture here. So we have the B0. We have a magnetization. And now, if the magnetization is just tilted, what this equation means by an angle theta, which is the flip angle, then we have the transverse component, which is m0 sine theta. And that transverse component will be precessing about z with a frequency gamma b0 over 2 pi. Or we'll have. Uh, moved in a certain time by omega L T. So this is what's happening in this case. That's what we see in the lab frame, for what the magnetization is doing. Now let's assume we're putting our rotating frame to rotate at exactly the Larmor frequency. OK, we always have a choice of the reference frame. That's a mathematical choice. Um, in this case, we have the choice to choose to describe the motion of the magnetization in a reference frame that ro ro rotates in the right direction with the Larmor frequency omega L. By the way, if you want to look at the calls, you're welcome to look at them in, in the break. So what is it happening in this reference frame? Well, if the, if the reference frame is rotating at exactly the right frequency of precession of the magnetization, in this reference frame, the magnetization is not moving. You don't see a motion in that reference frame. OK. So it processes in xy of the refer rotating reference frame with zero frequency. Yeah, but we still want this equation to be valid. But now we have a stationary magnetization. So this has, we have to adapt the equation of motion. So we want to have a precession with gamma delta b effective over 2 pi. But in this reference frame, the magnetization doesn't move. So something here on the right side has to be either collinear or zero. The magnetization is non-zero. The delta B effective is not likely to be collinear with the magnetization. So the conclusion is that in this description, we have to describe the motion with an effective magnetic field, delta B effective of zero. That's the consequence. So, and in this case, I can now draw you the animation of the motion of the magnetization, and here you go. In contrast to this one, which is rotating, this one is not moving at all. That's in this reference frame. So, the Larmor frequency in the ro rotating frame is given by gamma delta B effective, and delta B effective, in general case, is given by B0 minus the 
frequency of rotation of the reference frame divided by gamma. OK, if we choose omega rf equals omega l, the Larmor frequency, then in delta b effective becomes 0. This is now just a description for any omega, uh, rotating frame frequency. What does it mean in terms of vectorial depiction? What it means is if we start out with a b0 and we go into a rotating frame, then we have to subtract a fictitious magnetic field omega rf over gamma from b0 to get the delta b effective. OK. So I'll do a little supplement on um, the rotating, the quantum mechanical equivalences of the rotating frame, and then we'll come back to the classical picture. This supplement is really only introduced here to show you, since we are looking at a quantum mechanical phenomenon, there is a quantum mechanical basis for all this description. You can call it the proper physical description, but we actually can, in the case of water, what we're covering in the course, we can pretty much stay with the classical vectorial depiction of the equation of motion. So we don't need to every time think of um, Bra and Kett and Schrödinger equation, etc. But this is uh, what is going to come is the um, quantum mechanical equivalences. It's not very much in depth. It's just to scratch a bit the surface. Where are the analogies? Analogies. So here's the Schrödinger equation, which gives us the evolution of the wave function as a function of this operator, which is the Hamiltonian. If the Hamiltonian is constant in time, the solution of the wave function is an exponent. It's an exponential function that gives us the superposition of the wave functions. This is as a, as a, as a recollection, the expectation value of a certain operator we call it iz here, you'll see why this is introduced this way, is just given by this matrix operation here. Here's a vector, here's a vector, and here's a matrix. OK, so that's very briefly a recap of quantum mechanics. Now, what are the equivalences? So the z, the x, z magnetization is equal to the expectation value of iz, the operator iz. Same for mx, same for mi, my. So we have a quantum mechanical effect. What we are observing are macroscopic quantities, and they relate to a quantum mechanical quantity um, based on the nucleus. So these are the equivalences. So now what are these ix, iy, iz? And I'll give you here now for a spin one half. For two energy levels, these are the so-called Pauli spin matrices, iz, ix, and iy. Just to give you an idea, these are two by two matrices. They are orthogonal, orthonormal actually, and um, they describe the motion of the water molecule uh, very nicely. So how does one now determine the temporal evolution of the expectation, let's say, of Ix, which we said is representing the x component of the magnetization? And basically, in all general terms, you can take the Hamiltonian, Hs, and you can split it into two terms. One term is the one that has only constant values in it. OK? Think of it as a superposition of the Pauli spin matrices. Some of these Pauli spin matrices have, ha have, uh, have components which don't vary with time, and some of them vary with time. So basically, you have a two by two matrix with elements that are constant and with elements that are not constant. To give you an idea of what we're talking here, I won't go into explicit matrix calculation here. But basically, you just take the Hamiltonian, you write it into a Hamiltonian HS0 that has no time dependence, and a Hamiltonian V of t. And this gives you now the evolution of the wave function. And now there's another representation of quantum mechanics. That's the so-called interaction representation, which comes from higher order perturbation theory. So that's really fairly advanced quantum mechanics here. But just to give you the gist of the analogy here, in this case, one in the interaction representation, one writes the 
the, the, the wave function now as the solution of the motion if you had only the constant Hamiltonian here times the wave function that we started out with. And then what you get in this representation, it's essentially a uh, transformation. Then in the interaction representation, the temporal evolution of the wave function is given by the time-dependent Hamiltonian times the wave function here. So one takes away the static term of the Hamiltonian and the solution here is for the um, time-dependent Hamiltonian is given by, in the interaction representation, is given by uh, this term here in the Schrodinger representation times this transformation. Okay, so for a spin, what is our, the equivalent of the stationary term? Well, we got for the stationary term of the Hamiltonian, we've got something like gamma B0 IZ. We've said that this is along Z, so you can already guess this is essentially B0. And the time-dependent Hamiltonian here is now given by this term here. You have IX here, IY here. Those are these two operators, and you have the cosine and the sine in here. And now you can start to guess already what these terms represent. Right? So if you take omega RF equals gamma B0, so what is the now the time-dependent operator in uh, in this, this depiction, what does it look like? Well, it turns out that in the interaction representation, the time-dependent operator part vi of t becomes constant. <coughs> so, what does this mean? If you remember last week, we were talking about in the rotating reference frame applying a v1 field that is constant if it rotates at omega RF, and you can see here, that's now the complete analogy here. So what this means is basically the interaction representation corresponds in ma nuclear magnetic resonance to the um, change into the rotating reference frame. Quantum mechanical equivalences is R B0 is, is represented by the operator IZ, this guy, and B1 XY is described by IX and LY, so you can write your Hamiltonian that way. Okay. And if you really like quantum mechanics, there are wonderful books out there to study this in more detail. Um, but again, for our, for our intents and purposes, what comes out of quantum mechanics? is unequal population levels, and everything that we have here on the slide, we can deal with classical description of motion. The, um, there are some effects I will briefly mention that come from quantum mechanical interactions, but they are not very dominant. Okay, so now what does the motion of a magnetization look like in the presence of an RF field that induces a flip angle? We'll start out with a laboratory frame of reference. That's our frame of reference. Then we have the term B0. We have the term B1 of T times gamma, that cross M. And so what happens is, is we get a motion like this. Ultimately, the magnetization will turn into the transverse plane. What you really have is a motion like this. You have the term B0. So the magnetization goes around. In, with a frequency corresponding to hundreds of megahertz. Or let's just pretend it's 100 megahertz. So this is a gross simplification here. This goes around very fast. And from going from here to here, that is to do a 90 degree excitation, this is on the order of a millisecond. 100, meg me 100 megahertz, you can calculate um, how many hundreds of nanoseconds that is to do a complete turn. So this goes around many times until the magnetization is down here. OK, so I'll try to illustrate this here. This is the Z magnetization. This is the transverse magnetization. We'll apply a V1 field that rotates. And this is um, for a duration tau. So now we'll have a mutation of the magnetization at the frequency of Larmor frequency 
as it tips away from z-axis. So I'm going to try to decompose the vertical component of this path and the transverse component, but not to scale with what's really happening. So this is what's happening. Transverse component increases, and the, the z component, the longitudinal component, decreases. And once we are in the transverse plane, we're stopping to turn on the B1 field, and we've got all the magnetization in the transverse plane, like here. Now, in the rotating frame of reference, that's where it is. In this frame, the B1 is stationary. It's here. We have the Z magnetization as well. We have the transverse magnetization starting out with nothing. And now the RF field B1 will just simply tilt the Z magnetization into the transverse plane. And the amplitude of B1 determines how quickly this is happening. So here it is. The transverse plane, the transverse component increases, the longitudinal component decreases. This is just instead of showing you a vector that rotates, showing you what happens with the two components of the vector. OK, and here to, re to remind ourselves, the flip angle alpha, if one turns on the constant B1 in the rotating frame, the flip angle alpha is given by gamma B1 times tau, and tau is the duration of how long the B1 field has been turned on. After turning on the B1 field for tau, mil tau milliseconds, one has a Z magnetization that's M0 times cosine alpha, and a transverse magnetization that's M0 times sine alpha, we're going to make quite some use of these two equations for the rest of the semester. Just to give you some ideas, um, in magnetic resonance imaging, the gamma v1 over 2 pi is typically between 0.2 and 1 kilohertz. <coughs> OK, so that's, um, so now you imagine you got precession at 100 megahertz going around horizontally, and the tilt into the transverse plane goes with a frequency of a kilohertz. So how many times this goes around until it's down in the transverse plane? That's quite a dramatic difference, and that's why one uses the rotating frame uh, description of the motion. OK. So to recap what the motion is, I'll do this just before the break, this experiment here. So that is better visible on the screen. Um, I tried to do it last week. I'll try to do it again. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So here's the yellow ball that you can see is an electromagnet. The black tip gives you the direction of the electromagnet. And I will try to make it spin. That's the part that needs manual skills, which may not be the So here it is spinning, very uninteresting. If I turn the magnetic field, it rotates one way. Now I inverse the magnetic field, and now you can see it rotate the other way. Now I'm going to try to introduce the B1 field. You've seen it just, it just precesses in the presence of of the external field, and now we're going to try to change the B1 field at the same time. And you know, now you can see I was moving the magnet. That's actually a very good experiment. Um, you, could, you could see when I was moving this magnet here, which gives us a horizontal B1 field, at the frequency of the precession of what the spin here had, the sphere, with the external field, then I was able to change the direction of the magnet and therefore induce a, uh, a flip of the magnetization 
in analogy what's happening with the nuclear magnetization. So that's the, I just have to imagine it spins around horizontally at 100 megahertz and the flip happens in, in, with one kilohertz frequency. And you can imagine how difficult it is to just describe this. Okay, with that we'll break for the, um, for the break and we'll continue at 2.15 with the second part.